Hello, Alex. I can't imagine complaining about natural light since uh, this is what I'm giving you for this video. But I do have a bookshelf. I liked your last video so much, I'm copying it. <laughs> Syntax from the future here. I mean your books video, which I guess will become really obvious really soon anyway, but I felt like I needed to break in here to say that your feeling not enough video was so amazing and I'm really, really glad you made it. Even if you felt like you were oversharing, I'm really grateful that you could share that with me. There's a lot in there I want to keep thinking about. Like, I mean, I nearly cried. It's so good. But I don't know. For now, I just want to say that I am okay with being a perpetual beginner if it means sometimes we get to start things together. <laughs> I love talking about books and I thought it would be really fun for me as well to take a look back at what I read this year. Books were some of the best parts of this year, honestly, so I love hearing your thoughts on books and you usually give me great ideas for books to check out, so really a very welcome video on all fronts for me. Um, I'm not going to talk about all of the books I read this year, but I figured I would at least hit some of the highlights. So I started off the year by reading Rose Under Fire by Elizabeth Wine. It's the sequel to Codename Verity. I read this book originally in high school, but I reread it at the end of 2019 because I felt like crying and I knew this book would take me there. I was a kid who read a lot of fiction for young people about this time period, and I would say that these two books are some of the best written about the Holocaust and World War II that I have read as part of this genre. Um, I really appreciate that Rose Under Fire goes into a lot of the aftermath of concentration camps, which I feel like is a part of that history that goes a little bit less explored, especially in young people's literature. So uh, sorry to start us on a very downer note and for a wild change of pace, the next book I want to talk about that I read in 2020 was The Disasters by M.K. England. So this is a really fun sci-fi young adult YA book. Uh, that I read as a distraction from my senior thesis writing. Uh, we love procrastination. <laughs> anyway, um, I really liked this book. I thought it had some big Star Wars flavors. I say this as someone who's not in any way a Star Wars expert, but the parts of Star Wars that I am interested in, unlicensed spaceship pilots trying to save the galaxy, etc., etc., are sort of blended into um, a YA novel with some of the classic tropes of that, including a really fun groove cast and a lot of humor, as well as a coming-of-age narrative that's really cheesy, but I thought in a pretty cathartic way. I also read two books of poetry by Mary Oliver, Twelve Moons and House of Light. So it's not news to you that Mary Oliver is a wonderful writer of beautiful poetry, and honestly I don't think I can ever be grateful enough that you helped me find more of her work than my previous brief exposure to her poetry via the Blog Brothers channel. So these uh, books were actually the last books I read at our college library um, during that very tumultuous, like, some number of hours period at the end of winter term when we knew uh, that a lot was changing really fast, but we didn't necessarily know anything else about what our future really was going to look like. Um, so obviously that was a stressful moment, um, and I really intentionally went to Mary Oliver because I know that her poems are calming and interesting and just like really can help me settle myself and also just that I know because they're very meaningful to me. I really knew that I'd appreciate those being a part of that process for me. Um, some standouts from these books are The Pawns and the poem Last Days. Uh, the latter in particular, I think, hit so close to home because of the situation we were all in from. So shortly after all of that, I wound up rereading a lot of books, and this was largely because I desperately needed some things that were familiar and predictable and comforting. It's, I think, no real surprise that this is what I was seeking out during this super uncertain time that we all went through this year. Um, some notable books from that period, though, include The Wednesday Wars by Gary D. Schmidt. So this is a middle grade book, probably aimed at age like 10 to 14 years old. 
Um, I can't remember when I read it for the first time, but this is a book that definitely falls into my personal category of books for young people that should be considered classics. This book is a realistic coming of age story about a middle school boy, but there are some really important themes and beautiful moments within this book that I just always feel like it's worth it to come back to. Like, there's a lot of things I think I learned from this book, and I do learn from this book every time I go back to it. They're the kind of things that are worth learning more than once. Another book I reread during this time was Monstrous Regiment by Terry Pratchett. This is one of Sir Terry's many, many Discworld novels, but it's one of my personal favorites because it does the classic Discworld thing so well, which is that it is funny and ridiculous, but also at moments just very suddenly deep or poignant in ways that make me think a lot about the world, both of Discworld and our world. I also reread a YA fantasy series um, that's collectively called The Colors of Madeline series. I have all of the books. I'm really uh, great at holding three books at once. Oh, look at me go. Um, this one especially is a very beautiful book though. So this series is at least partially set in one of my favorite fantasy worlds of a book that I've ever read. The fantasy world is called Cello. Yes, it's named after the instrument and it's a place where colors are weather, there's invisible magic, and there's time travel, the format is semi-epistolary, and there's just like a really surprising amount of physics. I don't know, part of it's set in the fantasy Midwest, a la Fantasy Costco. It's great. I, I couldn't love it more. Reading them is like putting on a hand-me-down sweatshirt that I've had since middle school. They're just also comfortable and comforting, and I really still love them, even after all this time. I also read some books that were new to me over spring term, including Uprooted by Naomi Novik. Uh, this was a fantasy book that I read after catching a lot of positive reviews for it, but ultimately I think it was only okay for me. Some parts of it really hooked me, but others were just completely unappealing to me. I also read The Power by Naomi Alderman. This is a speculative fiction book set during a future where some women can electrocute people by touching them uh, with a plot that follows that thread to its obvious logical conclusion all the way into the complete dissolution of the patriarchy. So if that sounds like a lot, it really is. <laughs> this book was directly influenced by The Handmaid's Tale and as spec fic that centers women it also invites a lot of comparison to it from a lot of different places. I'm not sure if you've read The Handmaid's Tale. I think in terms of the framing of the books, and as well as like the absolute punch in the gut feeling they both gave me while I was reading it, they have a lot of similarities. However, I would say that the power was way less introspective and much more action-packed than The Handmaid's Tale, which I was not expecting going into it. I also listened to the audiobook of Between the World and Me by Ta-Nehisi Coates. Um, you know I'm not a huge audiobook person, but this was definitely a book where I would recommend the audio form. It's narrated by the author, and not only is he a fantastic writer, but he's a really, really amazing reader. Over the summer, I tried to get into reading mysteries again, but, you know, mixed results. I finished Maureen Johnson's Truly Debris series. This is a series of YA mystery novels that split between two mysteries, one set in the 1930s roughly, and one set in the present day. Uh, theoretically, both of these mysteries are solvable based on on-page clues, but I could not even come close to figuring out either of the mysteries, uh, particularly the past one, before some of the narrative set in the past just completely gave it away. Uh, however, one of these books does include the main character dressing up as Hercule Poirot, and I highly approve of this. <laughs> Speaking of Agatha Christie, I also read By the Pricking of My Thumbs. This is one of her other detective series. Uh, this is, again, a mystery book where I totally missed the solution. I feel like it came out of nowhere. I haven't reread it, but I really would like to, to figure out if there's any clues that I think could actually get me to the end point of this mystery. Like, I'm either missing some significant leaps you have to make or missing a lot of cultural context, which wouldn't be surprising. I also read The Lady's Handbook for Her Mysterious Illness by Sarah Raimi. 
Um, this I wanted to read because it sounded like an interesting blend of science and memoir, but it took a hard and unexpected turn into spirituality about three quarters of the way through and really left my head spinning. And I also read The Dreamers by Karen Thompson Walker. Like you mentioned, a lot of people we know read this in the last few months. This is a pandemic book, and yes, it absolutely gutted me. Yeah, I read it uh, far too late at night, one night when I couldn't sleep, and boy, did this not help me get any sleep. I'm not learning from my mistakes whatsoever. I'm still trying to hold three books. <laughs> so late in the summer, I also reread the entire Percy Jackson series, of, of which these are a part. It's written by Rick Riordan, and I wound up actually reading some of the later additions to the series for the first time. So look, in my defense, I did spend a week in late summer with no power, no access to phone or internet, very limited mobility, just like not a lot of options. And between me and my younger brother, we own basically the entire series. So it's a good time to pick it back up. I was um, absolutely obsessed with these books from the ages of about 11 to 13. Uh, so it's really difficult for me to have new or useful or not incredibly like personal and subjective thoughts about these. Um, but anyway, they're middle grade books about modern day children of the Greek gods and their various dangerous shenanigans. Um, I, I really stand by the opinions I'd already formed, which is not a surprise to me that the initial series is very good and fun and has some elements that are very well done, and then things go ambitiously and spectacularly off the rails in follow-up books. So if you're noticing a theme that I read a lot of middle grade books, you're really not wrong. I tend to really love books that fall into this category for whatever reason. Like, I do think there's been a lot of talk recently about adults or older people reading YA books, um, because there's been a lot of YA books in the last several years that have gotten a lot of hype especially due to trends of turning these bigger books into big smash hit movies. So I do think there's a lot of people thinking about adults when you're talking about YA books, um, which I don't necessarily see happening as much with middle grade books. But, you know, I am at this point older than both the middle grade and YA target audiences, but I'm definitely still reading books in both of these categories. There are so many middle grade books I see at work that I'm so interested in reading. I think something that really draws me to these books is that they tend to just have a lot of heart at their center. I wind up really, really caring about the characters. And when these books are well done, they manage to do so much in such a short package. I don't know, they've been really appealing to me lately. So yeah, I have picked up quite a few middle grade books lately. Some of the recent standouts among these include The Pants Project by Kat Quick. Uh, this is a book about terrible school dress codes, making new friends, and standing up for yourself. I also really recently loved Redwood and Ponytail by K.A. Holt. This is a very, very, very sweet novel in verse about two girls' first crushes. Uh, it also inexplicably includes a Greek chorus of Alex's, that's never explicitly referenced by any of the characters or explained in any way. It also includes obvious One Direction stand-in boy band misdirection, an absolute delight. I want to finish off this video by mentioning two other books that I've read recently that I know I've already recommended to you, but I just feel like I do have to bring them up because they were both pretty good reads and a pretty good way to round out this year of reading, I think. The first is The Raven Tower by Anne Lecky. This is a fantasy book that's told from a really unique and mysterious point of view with a really interesting approach to the way magic works. I think the author does a great job of initially building up two separate stories that are both engaging, but then bringing them together in a way that really surprised me. I didn't see it coming, but it was also really satisfying and I don't feel like in connecting those two dots anything really got lost along the way. This is also a book where I wanted to, I would say if you like me uh, read Hamlet a few years ago and then wondered how all of this stuff must feel from Horatio's point of view like this is definitely the book for you. And finally I read Tell the Machine Goodnight by Katie Williams. This is speculative fiction where 
The world is pretty similar to ours, but there are machines available called Apricity that can tell you what will make you happy in little fortune cookie sized snippets. Initially, I decided to pick this book up because even though it is a novel, it reads a lot like a series of short stories, and that was really working for my attention span. However, I got way more drawn into the book than I expected, because even though this is technically science fiction, the book focuses mainly on a few characters' lives, um, their internal thoughts and feelings and relationships, and the ways that all of those things are affected by the way they interact with this technology. So it feels way more introspective and domestic than a lot of sci-fi does. Since I've heard you talk more about Hank's books, I've also started thinking back to this book about the ways that the technology here relates to our real life technology. I don't think this book has as much to say about the social internet as a beautifully foolish endeavor and an absolutely remarkable thing do, but I do think that the more time I spend thinking about it, the more time I am drawing connections between the way the apricity machines work in this book and the way things like cell phones do in our regular modern day lives and just the different effects they have. Yeah, I would say this is a book that rewards a lot of further contemplation, kind of similar, at least it sounds like, to Hank's books. And yes, that is my biggest reading goal for 2021, to actually uh, reread an absolutely remarkable thing so I can read a beautifully foolish endeavor. So that was my 2020 in reading maybe the most pleasant way to look at 2020. You should definitely let me know if you read any of these books or if you have read any of these books because I would super love to talk to you about them. And hopefully we can both look forward to another good year for reading in 2021. See you next year, Alex. Dad jokes, dad jokes. <laughs>